Um, this is native bees and large mammals, vertebrate invertebrate interactions in riparian natural areas, and uh, partnering with pollinators, prairie restoration to support diverse pollinating insects. Um, and um, Oh, sorry. Um, we, and the first presentation is going to be by Mary Rowland of the U.S. Forest Service, along with Sandy Devano of Oregon State University. And they're going to be presenting the first talk. And then the second talk will be Tom Kay of the Institute of Applied Ecology. And we are so pleased to have them today. Thank you so much. for. Um, it, it takes a little while to get everybody together and on here, and it's great that they were able to um, give so generously of their time. So we appreciate that. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, from beginning. Um, you know all that. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit and for a few minutes, and forgive me, this won't take long. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this pollinator uh, webinar series. Um, this is the second of four webinars. We have seven total speakers. Um, we've had the support of several organizations in putting this series together. We're very, very grateful, notably Pollinator Partnership, the Bureau of Land Management, and of course our main partner, the U.S. Forest Service. Um, this series is a really good example of the kind of thing that we feel we do well, that this really fulfills our mission. Um, we get practitioners the info they need where and when they need it. This series serves as a companion initiative to our forthcoming synthesis paper, um, which will be on pollinator health and resilience in natural areas management. Um, that will come out a little later this year. Some of the information contained in this series was originally shared in a pollinator symposium at the 2017 Natural Areas Conference, by the way. Um, let's see. Um, the upcoming webinar, Check out these titles, <laughs> they're, they're long. Um, we'll be in two weeks, exactly. Um, the first talk on that day is gonna be Dave Waldine, Affiliated Scholar at the Christopher Newport University, Management Considerations of Pollinating Bats on Wind and Solar Farms. So we're excited to hear about that. And the second talk that day will be by Peter Beasley, Vegetation Program Manager and expert with um, PG&E, Utility Right-of-Way Management that Supports Pollinators and Safe Energy Transmission. So we've got, we've got things going on. Um, and then there will be another one in April uh, after that. Um, and then we are gonna continue to have webinars and um, just not in this particular series. That series will end at the end of uh, April. Um, I just want to, just a couple notes. Pollinators are big. Uh, we, we have our members tell, tell us all the time what an important topic this is to them. Um, so th this webinar series is obviously part of that. Um, this series is free for all attendees. Um, so far, the access to the archive is, uh, you can get it through links on our site or through our YouTube channel. That is free as well. Um, I want to apologize, we were not able to get the archive of last time's um, uh, webinar. We had some tech problems. Uh, we apologize for that. The slides are, however, available. Um, if you're interested in pollinators, in 2016, we published a special edition of the journal. You can see it there on Managing for Pollinators. It's one of our biggest sellers. And uh, the 2018 Natural Areas Conference will feature prominently quite a bit of programming on pollinators and natural areas management. More on that very shortly. Um, let me tell you a little bit about us. Don't worry, I won't make it long. Um, for those of us who don't know, for those of you who don't know us, we've been working to support the community of natural areas professionals for more than 40 years. Um, our conference that is coming up is our 45th. So we've been around a long time. Uh, we're the only national nonprofit membership organization dedicated to the support and advancement of the community of natural areas professionals. Um, that's our mission. That's our only mission. We are here for people just like you. Uh, many of all already know us through our journal, which is our peer-reviewed publication for scientists and natural areas professionals to share research. Um, a subscription to the journal does come with membership. We also hold the conference annually. This year's is in Bloomington, Indiana. October 23 to 25, more on that in a second. And our call for proposals is open. I can't say that often enough. Uh, we just de debuted a brand new website and member portal, which gives members access to a lot more of resources and tools. We're really proud of this. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's a new thing that we're able to, to offer our members. Um, we invite you to become a member if you're not already. It's 
it's not expensive. <laughs> our, our bottom, um, our, our, we have a student level that is lower, but our regular membership level is $75 a year. That's one fancy coffee per month. So, um, the Natural Areas Conference call for proposals is open. Um, we're super excited about this. So that it's going to be three days of symposia, oral sessions, poster presentations, social networking events, and field workshops. Um, I am so close to being able to tell you who our closing plenary speakers are. Oh, like another 24 hours, but I can't I can't make it public yet because we, we're still drawing up the paperwork. So, but be aware that we're going to have some great people coming. Um, our, our opening plenary keynote is going to be author Scott Russell Sanders, and if you know him, he's really fascinating. We're excited to have him. Um, so go to our website, naturalareas.org, um, and go to the conference tab, and you can. There's lots of information about our conference, where it's going to be held, the hotels, and the call for proposals page is exhaustive. I've made it as clear as I possibly can as far as all the kind of proposals we're interested in seeing from you guys. Um, I think that is enough about that you're going to be hearing more hearing more about the conference in the coming weeks and we really hope to see you all there it's it's going to be a special event um we want to thank our partner the u.s forest service finally uh before we move on to some other things um it's been they, it's only through their generous support that we can offer this series at all so thank you for that um before we turn to the presentation just a couple of last minute things um this webinar should be available on youtube and through our site we're going to use the chat function to ask questions, and the speakers have told me that they are going to pause in the middle and at the end to answer questions, so don't be surprised if you ask a question that isn't immediately answered. They can see all of your questions, and we will try to get to all of them. So with that, we are, I'm going to pass control to Mary. Mary and Sandy, you guys can come up and show yourselves, and here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it usually takes a minutes for the slides to come up, but um, in the interim, we, we are really happy to have um, Mary and Sandy with us today. Um, here come the slides. Mary is uh, going to take sort of the, the lead on this, but Sandy's here to answer quite a few questions, too, because they have different specialties. Take it away, Mary. Okay, good morning. So I'm assuming you can see the presentation. And um, thanks so much, everyone, for attending. It, it's great the turnout they've gotten, and we really appreciate the Natural Areas Association making this whole series uh, possible. It's a great opportunity for all of us. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, I said, Sandy, Sandy's the entomologist here. I'm the wildlife biologist, so she's really the, the bee expert. A couple of her uh, really fine students, Sam Roof and Lauren Smith, helped with the work, as well as Tyler, who's our BID expert. And this is part of a very large multidisciplinary project uh, at our research site. So I'd just like to acknowledge the many partners involved in this work. So today, we'll start out talking a little bit about herbivorian pollinators, what connections they may have, with a focus on native bees as the pollinator of interest, and deer, elk, and cattle as the herbivores. I'll talk a little bit about our research site and the Meadow Creek Restoration Project. And then we'll describe a literature review we conducted at the start of this to just look at the potential for dietary overlap between large mammals and bees. And then speak a little bit about some of the bee floral association work and preferences with this project. And then talk some, about some of our initial findings about the impacts of grazing on both the flowering community and the bees in this restored riparian area. And then we'll wrap up with a few management considerations. And so there are a lot of challenges, as we know, in, in managing natural areas and other lands uh, because many of these have a multiple use mandate. And so you have to look at competing objectives as you explore and manage these systems. And of course, we live in a, a world of in, increasingly structured systems and novel landscapes. And so we have um, lots to consider in these systems. Two of those components are native pollinators and large herbivores. And although there has been some research there, it's not extensive on the interactions between these two groups. And we also know that grazing effects can really vary uh, widely the, over space and time and also according to the specific species that we're interested in. But both these groups are very important in terms of ecosystem services and just their general interest uh, to society at large. 
The system we're talking about today is a terrestrial riparian system, which has its own particular value in that these systems often have relatively high biodiversity, especially in semi-arid areas and rangelands where water is more limited, and they often then support unique species assemblages. And because of their value, they, they do have often this, this history of disturbance and restoration. You have everything from dams, water diversions, uh, crops, you know, agriculture, uh, livestock grazing, you know, a lot of um, use for that water in these riparian systems. And they do provide key grazing resources, in particular, in, again, in semi-arid systems for, for livestock who are often the subject of litigation on public lands. So how might large herbivores impact bees? Well, the most obvious is really just looking at the plants themselves, the plant architecture and, and growth and actually species diversity. So by consuming flowering stems, you obviously reduce the abundance of pollen and nectar available for bees. You can uh, remove nesting material through grazing. There can also be things like soil compaction. Sandy was involved with a very unique manipulative study of cattle grazing and bees on the Zumwalt Prairie in Eastern Oregon and found you know, that this trampling can affect soils as well as habitat for um, ground nesting bees. And then there are even microhabitat conditions that can be affected, uh, such as temperature and relative humidity. So our study site is in Eastern Oregon um, up here and at the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range. And Meadow Creek, the system we're talking about, runs through here. It's a pretty common um, mixed conifer system, 50 to 60 centimeters of rain a year, about 11 to 1500 meter elevation. And I mentioned this is the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range. It's one of about 75 experimental forests that the US Forest Services manages, manages for research. And Meadow Creek is an important salmon bearing stream that's perennial and spans about 13 kilometers in Starkey and then runs on into the Grand Ronde River. Uh, the management in this system and the, the degradation in, is very similar to, to other streams in this watershed. And there have been livestock, primarily cattle, around here for more than 70 years, uh, plus deer and elk, that sort of background herbivory by wild onions. So this restoration project was initiated by the Forest Service with the help of Bonneville Power and others in 2012. And it's very typical of what happens on many streams in the Pacific Northwest with salmon. Um, it was initiated in 2012 and they came in and planted over 50,000 shrubs and trees, a variety of deciduous species and conifers, all native, and also place these large boulders and logs to create pool habitat for fish and um, constructed new pastures. We have a, basically a new livestock grazing system. So new cattle fencing, as well as research exposures. And you'll see here in the lower right, this sort of circular pod. I'll be talking about those protective pods later and how they impact um, plant growth. And then this deferred rotation system for cattle. So cattle were pulled off when this uh, restoration began. Uh, Starkey has had a normal uh, cattle rotation system with permittees for many, many years, um, but they were pulled off until 2017. So they just came back in last summer. So the overall objective was to really look at habitat and population recovery of fish under this restoration. But we realized we had a great opportunity with these research exposures established across the sites to look at many other response variables, including native pollinators. So brought in Sandy and her crews to look at bees, but we're also looking at small mammals and stream temperature and the plants themselves. So underlying the pollinator research at Meadow Creek, really the, the overarching idea is to understand that riparian bee community and what drives it in this system, to look specifically at bee flower relationships, but then to look at how wild ungulates versus livestock impact these floral resources used by bees in the system, and actually partitioning out effects by these two types of ungulates, which is sort of a rare opportunity. And last, to look at responses of bees to the restoration overall. And so in terms of what Sandy and Cruz have found so far just in sampling 
they've counted on their transects more than 25,000 stems. So we have a really good sample size going into this with about 116 species of blooming shrubs and forbs encountered so far and um, all together. And those are on the transects, but in the system, they've identified more than 150 clones. And so this pie chart just shows the 10 most common here down the right. Um, slender cinquefoil, the most common, about 11% of the stems counted. Uh, so, but what you see is basically about 40% is all these other species of the 150. So we have about 10, 10 species that are dominating in this system that are most common. So if we look, these are just the plants now from 2014 to 16. We look at differences in space and time. So our, our y-axis here is the mean stem count per site. And if we look at the seasonal difference, so Sandy and crew have sampled in four sampling bouts. You see that the abundance of flowers is fairly steady uh, across these three bouts until you hit September. And this is very common um, in this semi-arid system. It's very dry. Pretty much everything is senesced and um, isn't really there by September. And you see the same pattern with richness. Um, this is the species richness. And again, that's fairly steady, although, although of course um, these are different species that are occurring, but the total numbers are about the same as you go across the seasons, again, until September when there's not much left at all. Now, if we look at the spatial variation from sites one to 12, which is basically upstream to downstream, uh, we see a pattern of abundance being greater at the uppermost reach versus downstream. And some of these are actually significantly different. We also see a bit of a pattern in richness, but, but not as much. And this, if we look, you know, we wish the world and our replicates were all um, perfectly the same, but they're not. I mean, this is a very dynamic and diverse system. And up here in the upper reaches, we have the, the best riparian community that was left in terms of uh, the flowering shrubs, the willows, um, and, and just overall diversity. And down here, there was actually, um, in the name of research for, for cattle on the experimental forest early on in the 40s and 50s, uh, pretty um, massive like bulldo bulldozers, um, cleaning up the riparian system and planting meadow foxtail and other exotic perennial grasses for livestock forage. And the legacy of that change persists. Uh, so it is a diverse system from these sites from one to 12. And Sandy will talk a little bit here about the bees found so far at Meadow Creek. Right, so I'll just give you an overview of the, the bee community uh, at our sites. Um, over the, the period from 2014 to 2016, we've collected over 8,000 bees, um, over 170 different species and 29 genera. And so this pie chart you see here gives you an idea of the relative proportion of the different genera that make up that community. And so what you can see is there's two really common groups, uh, the sweat bees, which are the genera Lasioglossum and Holictus, and then also bumblebees or Bombus. And so for those of you that are interested in bumblebees, we have about, uh, we have 14 species, uh, including the Western bumblebee, uh, Bombus occidentalis, which is a species of concern. And it makes up about one to 2% of the entire bumblebee community. Um, not surprisingly, of course, the relative composition of these genera varies through the season. So some of our common early, uh, oh, actually, wait, we can stay there. You can go, yeah, that'd be great. Um, some of our common early uh, season genera include and Andrina, Lasioglossum, and Osmia. And then mid-season, we get a lot of bumblebees, Millisodes, and Anthophora. And then finally, late in the season, our common genera are Megakylie, Colictus and uh, Anthidium. So, so now, now we can go to the next slide, Mary, thanks. Um, so, so this is a slide very similar to the one that Mary already showed you uh, with blooming stems. And it's meant to show you the variability both seasonally and spatially in bee, bee abundance and also bee genus richness. So it's important to note this is bee genus richness here in these graphs. Um, and what you see is you really have a peak in bee abundance and uh, richness uh, occurring in July, August. Um, 
and kind of a, a slower buildup of both of those compared to blooming stems. But again, a kind of a decrease uh, in September as we saw with blooming stems. Um, the abundance and richness patterns spatially are very similar in the sense that there's a lot of variability uh, from one site to another. Uh, as you saw with the blooming stems. Um, uh, a lot of that, uh, those error bars are large primarily because of seasonal variation. So it's really not uh, surprising to see such large error bars. Um, you may wonder how the spatial variability in bee abundance and richness compares with a blooming stem uh, abundance and richness. So for example, uh, do sites with blooming, uh, more blooming stems also have more bees overall? And in fact, that's the case. Uh, overall bee abundance for each site is correlated with a blooming stem abundance pretty highly. Um, but the same relationship doesn't hold true for floral richness and bee genus richness. So uh, sites with more blooming plant species don't necessarily have more bee genera. And then kind of a final interesting note about this slide uh, is that Spatially, there's really no consistent hotspots for uh, bee abundance or genus richness. And so there's no correlation uh, in those two variables from one point of time to the next of the site. So we can't generalize the relative value of a particular site at one point in time uh, to a later period of time. And so the hotspots are moving around spatially, so to speak, which is really an important consideration to think about uh, as others have observed, of course, when you're designing a monitoring program. Okay, I'm back to Mary. All right, thanks, Sandy. So now I'll talk a little bit about the literature review we conducted to um, begin this study to look at potential for dietary overlap. Uh, we used published literature on deer, elk, and cattle, and bees. Um, most of the information came from technical reviews on, on bee diets. And so the couple of charts that will follow this are based on comparisons of the 74 flowering species from year one of the sampling at Meadow Creek. So they're all using that as sort of a reference. Um, so here with those 74 species, um, this first column, how many matches were there at the genus level uh, with genera reported in diets of these focal groups and what was at Meadow Creek? And here we can look at the species level, which of course is smaller. And all of this and the initial work is, is published in the Natural Areas Journal in a special pollinator issue in 2016. And so really the take home of this was for potential for dietary overlap, elk by far, you know, percentage wise and absolute numbers have the greatest potential for um, overlap with, you know, consuming species that are found at, at Meadow Creek. Um, over half the, or 78% of the genera and almost half the species found there are reported in elk diets. Now, if we look at how deer, elk, and cattle diets overlap with what's reported for bees, we can see they're all, they're all pretty similar at the genus and species level, um, mostly you know, 60 to 50% uh, potential dietary overlap with the plants we're finding at Meadow Creek. So now the Bee Flower Association was Samantha's work as an undergraduate and she hand netted bees that were foraging on flowers with specific time belts throughout bouts throughout the system and then also quantified the availability of flowers through these um, counts of flowering stems on transects and this paper is in press in northwest science now and one of the things she did one of her focal areas was looking at how bee visitation differed or might differ between native plants and introduced plants because this system as i mentioned does have a, a variety of introduced plants so there are 11 species here on the x-axis and the y is the visitation rate bees observe per blooming plant and the green species here on the left are the natives and then we have the introduced on the right and the numbers here are the counts of flowering stems so these were like 12 focal species uh, the big one here is bull thistle had a huge visitation rate uh, compared with others. But if you look at it, if you analyze this, there is really no preference on native status or not um, overall. And two of these, uh, Canada thistle and common mullen, actually had zero bee visitors, although they were very common uh, introduced plants in this system. Now, if we just look at what 
they did prefer. It turns out uh, she did uh, quite a few analyses with all these various plant characteristics and flower color did not really have any effect on the types of bees, the composition of the bee community visiting, nor did native status. But flower morphology, these different shapes you see here with simple versus disc florets and different kinds of symmetry did influence it, was highly correlated with the types of bees visiting. And basically, bees with shorter tongues and these smaller bodies were on the simpler flowers. And so really, if you're trying to enhance bee diversity, probably planting things that show quite a bit of variation and diverse morphology may be more important. And here's just a list of some of the common and attractive flowering plants in this system for bees. And here we look at those that actually were visited at a much higher rate than expected given how common they were or uncommon in the environment. And again, here's this um, bull thistle, but also things you know, like dandelion, which is um, introduced as well. So now I'll switch and talk a little bit. Um, Actually, I won't. I'll pause here. Uh, this might be a good time to pick up some questions or answer some questions. And I don't know, Sandy, if you've been looking at chats, if we have any. Let's see. We have one question. Has Starkey done research on native milkweed restoration? And Mary, uh, not that I'm aware of, but. No, um, not at all at this point. Okay. Is there anything else or should we? I think that's it. Okay. Um, so now if we look at the experimental design here to look at grazing effects, essentially this whole experiment for all these responses was set up to examine four levels of herbivory. You start over here, the red is a cattle fence, so um, exclosure type one has deer and elk present, but cattle excluded, so the deer and elk can jump the fence easily. The yellow fence is a game-proof fence. So here in number two, cattle are brought in through a gate, but otherwise excluded. Deer and elk are excluded. Three has no large herbivores. And then four is just sort of the extant grazing condition with everybody um, there. So these exclosures are about a hectare each. And then this whole system was replicated in three of the five pastures at Meadow Creek. Um, the data we're talking about, though, are from just three years, 2014 to 16. And so it's really just two levels of herbivory because there are no cattle in the system yet. So deer and elk are in basically treatments one and four, and then two and three have total exclusion from grazing. So as I'd mentioned before, there are these belt transects that uh, were sampled for flowering stems around the blue vein traps. And then Sandy and crew counted all stems with flowers by species. And I'll present, as I'd mentioned, data for three years. And there were typically four bouts, one year three, um, and across these 12 sampling sites. And so really, if you, if you think about what constitutes a, a realized overlap, you have to look at overlap in the taxa. You know, are the taxa visited by bees, uh, the same as those consumed by ungulates? And then you want co-occurrence of these groups in time. But in fact, you have to think, you know, Ungulates can come in earlier and graze and remove floral stems and move on, and then the bees come in there, not there. So um, it's not a complete coincidence in, in time that can affect them. But then there's, you also want this co-occurrence in, in space. And really, for Starkey, it's, it's elk that are consuming these plants. Uh, the deer are maybe four times less common there. We just don't have that many mule deer as well as the fact, as we saw earlier, the elk diets are uh, much more have much more in common with the bee diets than deer. We do not have the data analyzed yet, although cattle were brought in last year, um, we don't have those data compiled yet. I wanted to go ahead and show this graph from another study that Josh Averett has published in Forest Ecology and Management, and this is just looking at the riparian plantings that were put in to just show, I'd mentioned those circular pods. So these are protected. These are deciduous shrubs protected in those pods versus not. To just emphasize, we are seeing a very pronounced herbivory effect by the wild ungulates on the plantings. And so of course this can have repercussions for, you know, elk are drawn into this area to browse by all this delicious food. And then you can see um, potential repercussions with sort of opportunistic, um, grazing on flowering stems and other foods for bees. 
So we would have expected that the flowering stems would be more or less the same in the grazed and ungrazed sites initially, but that over time you would expect for species that are preferred by elk that those would become less abundant in the grazed plots, whereas the others should be more or less the same over time. So here we look at five common species in elk diets for, and also species for which we had good samples of blooming stems. And we can see that in our first year, 2014, there really wasn't any difference between the grazed and the blue and the ungrazed plots. Again, not as many stems in 2015, but again, no difference. But by 2016, um, we are definitely starting to see this trend of a significant difference in the counts of blooming stems in the particular ungrazed plots. So we look here at the most common plant that was counted and is also uh, quite preferred uh, by elk. And we see that pattern of that we expected sort of playing out here with no difference early on, a little bit different, <coughs> excuse me, larger difference in 2015 and by 2016, a pronounced difference in fewer stems in the grazed plots. Although we don't see that pattern here, which is not really a preferred species by elk, um, and this one tends to regrow pretty quickly after grazing. And we essentially see a little difference early on, which is again, a slight difference, but then over time, um, no difference. So now a little bit about the bee community. So these were sampled with vein traps as well as pan traps. And these are data just for one year for 2016 with the four bouts. So if we look at bee abundance in the grazed and ungrazed plots, and we look at May versus July, which as Sandy's mentioned, we have different communities of bees occurring in these times, there was really no difference in bee abundance across these two. However, it's pretty interesting when you do look at richness in terms of bee species, we definitely see both in May and in July, more pronounced in July, a significant difference with greater bee species richness in the protected exclosures. So in conclusion, when we look at the realized effects of large mammal herbivory, we need to remember that it, it depends not only on sort of time and space, but also the dietary preferences of both the bees and the grazers, but the relative abundance of other floors, flowers and forage. I mean, Elk will come in, you know, and like I said, they, they can be strongly attracted to things like willows, which are highly palatable, but then, you know, while there, feed on preferred forbs as well. And because the space at which, the, the scale at which ungulates operate, you know, their space use is driven by a lot of things. They respond to human disturbance. Um, elk at Starkey move when cattle come in. Um, they're highly drawn to, you know, phenology, to plants that are just sort of following this green wave, if you will. And so you have to look at their scale of habitat selection, which will ultimately influence other things like floral resources for bees. And so dietary overlap, I think, definitely occurs in time and space. We are trying, well, we, we plan to uh, do more specific uh, analysis through um, metabarcoding of fecal DNA to see what elk are eating in this system. Um, but they are really big ecosystem engineers. And so we know that their, their movements and their, their feeding habits can definitely affect resources of other groups and, and may have impacts um, in space and time over others such as wild bee pollinators. And so, to look at what we might consider in managing these riparian natural areas, uh, first we want to identify who the key grazers and who the key species are in the bee community, especially in any sensitive species. As Sandy mentioned, um, we have several of the Bomba species here. And look at key areas of overlap just based on what you know about the seasonal distributions of both the bees and the herbivores as well as phenology. And as Sandy said, it's really interesting. It's a very dynamic system. And so you can't just sample at one point in time and get this snapshot and think that you understand that bee community because um, the composition of that community varied widely and there was not much uh, correlation at all between what was a very diverse site, you know, at this point in time versus later. 
And thinking about repair and restoration, you know, the whole idea is that you're putting in these shrubs uh, with this project to restore that riparian community and ultimately provide a strong, a strong stream shrub community to provide shade for fish. But the, the shrubs that are planted tend to attract wild ungulates. And so you have this sort of cascading effect, which is why they typically fence many of these. Um, but among the flowering shrubs used in this restoration effort, most are mass bloomers in spring, uh, just when the first bees are showing up as well. And so they're not only attractive to ungulates, but also bees. And in fact, this year, Sandy has a graduate student who will just be starting to sample bee use of these flowering shrubs, which we have not done so far. And I think will be really interesting because this is, as I mentioned, a very common practice throughout the Pacific Northwest. And no one has really looked at the bee use of the shrubs that are being put into these systems. And so in these active projects, which um, have a lot going on in terms of really land disturbance to, to restore this, um, it's probably best to keep some areas undisturbed and, and work through these installments. And of course, there are other habitat features like hollow stems and leafy materials that bees require for nesting. And so looking at this whole picture of pollinator requirements uh, would be prudent. And uh, also just consider that these riparian communities can actually provide pollination services for adjacent croplands, depending on proximity. But um, I think the importance of maintaining these these bee communities in wildland systems is, is increasing all the time. And last, just think about a diversity of flowering species in these projects to provide pollen and nectar across the season because um, as we saw, there, there are really different bees visiting and, and different flowers blooming. And also thinking about what Sam has found in terms of that flower morphology and a diversity of morphological types. And with that, um, thanks everyone. And I guess we'll answer any additional questions. Okay, well, Mary, I've been keeping track, I think, of most of the questions that we've gotten so far. Um, and there's some uh, that are kind of related to the uh, deer elk. So should we just start with those or? Sure. Okay, so one of them uh, asks, going back to the overlap of bee and ungulate diets, did you hypothesize that deer would reduce resources for pollinators? And, uh, oh, I mean, Mary, you've got a lot to say on that, I know, but in short, in short, yes, we did to the extent that deer were active in the system and uh, given that their dietary preferences are, are a bit different than, than elk, right, Mary? Right, but they certainly feed on, on flowering shrubs and, and herbs. Um, as well. They're just, we would anticipate, um, hypothesize, uh, more minimal impact just because of their smaller body size and the fact that there are so, so many fewer in this system. And then that kind of relates to another question that someone asked is, would you expect to see similar results in a system dominated by mule deer? Um, I think probably you would if you had the, um, the same sort of abundance. Uh, mule deer do have somewhat different preferences in terms of specific forbs, um, but yes, I, I think you would definitely uh, see some impacts of mule deer. Yeah, and then kind of a related, another related question is, uh, were the species preferred by elk primarily native species? If so, did this impact food sources available to more specialized bee species? resulting in a correlated decline in bee richness. And so, uh, well, is, and so there's two, two ways that we could have looked at that. The first was through the literature review, and we didn't do a formal analysis of uh, elk preference by whether the plant was exotic or native. Um, so uh, my impression generally was that you know, there's a lot of both. And as far as in the Starkey system, some of our most common plants out there are, are native, flowering forbs are native. And so, um, so I don't think we have, I don't think we have any data that suggests that they prefer native um, forbs or shrubs, but we haven't formally looked at that, right, Mary? 
I agree. Yeah, that has not been looked at. And, and really, you know, it, we're, we're hypothesizing about uh, the effects on these species. I mean, we, we do have the enclosures where we can see, you know, differences in counts of stems, but um, there are actually other, other herbivores and um, yeah, it, it just, ideally you would, you would have, like I said, the fecal analysis, so we, you would know exactly what species they are eating. But of course, um, you know, the animals, elk, elk are traveling, you know, several kilometers a day. And so they may actually be feeding, you know, in the uplands and, and defecating in the riparian area and, and vice versa. So it gets pretty difficult to quantify without, you know, actual visual observations of, of grazing on particular species. And, and we will be looking at this because it's all uh, fairly uh, new, and so we are going to be exploring some of these. Uh, either the bee richness response was very interesting, and so we do want to kind of focus in on that, uh, see which bees were missing, right, and, and then potentially uh, see what we know about their uh, dietary preferences. So um, I'm hoping I'm hoping we'll have more to say about that in the future. Um, an another question, Mary, was uh, how was the number of cattle decided on for bringing into enclosure areas? Well, um, that was just based on typical stocking rates in this region. And of course, that, that's sort of a, a, a I say, um, not very straightforward part of this analysis. So I think there were six cow-calf pairs brought in for a couple days, but again, you know, we realized that there was no way to have that, that part of the experiment um, totally replicate what happens in a, in a natural grazing system. I mean, the cattle outside, you know, were sort of moved through in, uh, it was pretty much a short duration, higher intensity grazing. Um, so we just, we put the animals in based on the size, you know, that one hectare exposure to try and um, replicate, you know, what would happen in a, a natural um, public lands grazing system. Okay, um, and then we've got another, again, kind of related question that says, can ungulate grazing have an indirect benefit for floral resources for bees by keeping areas as non-forest and therefore suitable habitat for the plants that bees visit? So I guess the idea there would be something like deer, which might eat more shrubs, potentially keep, keep the forest canopy more open. I think you would have to have an incredibly high um, density of animals to actually retard succession. In, the, in this system, that, that doesn't happen. I mean, Starkey has even a pretty healthy elk population and um, following uh, spruce budworm and prescribed fires and everything, I mean, the stocking rate of conifers is tremendous. So um, there just isn't enough um, they're in, yeah, and, and also, they I mean, they're not eating the conifers, which were, are the main uh, trees that are growing up, and they do retard the shrub growth, but not enough that I would say to keep it in an open area. Okay, um, and then we've got another question. Uh, do you think that if grazing is managed correctly, you might see an increase in floral species, especially annuals in grazed areas, because of the disturbance decreasing grasses and allowing more forbs? So I assume they're talking about livestock grazing in this question. Right, I, I'm suspecting that that would not happen. Again, it would depend on the system. The one thing I, I could think, some, you know, some of these species, these flowering species, respond positively to light grazing in that they produce more flowers, you know, with herbivory. And so um, in certain systems and with certain plants, that could be a positive effect of grazing. But I, I don't see um, yeah, and you wouldn't want a system where you, you had grasses declining. I mean, the perennial grasses here are foundational to um, soil stability and just the community overall. Okay. I just wanted to jump in here really quickly, just in the interest of making sure that we're um, moving forward and making everything timely. Uh, Sandy, how about two more questions? And I just want to make a promise to everyone who has questions that haven't gotten answered. I'm going to record them and make sure that we um, that I get them to Mary and Sandy, and uh, hopefully we can get those questions answered via email if that works out. Yeah, that'd be great. 
Um, well, one of the first questions was, uh, they were wondering how ungulates affect temperature and humidity, and that was really through their effect on plant architecture and cover, and so we're talking about microhabitat temperature and humidity, and so work shown that if you get a lot of biomass removed, you can actually increase uh, temperature and decrease uh, microhabitat humidity, which could influence uh, nesting habitat for bees, so that was, that's the answer to that question, and then, uh, Let's see, we've got one more, let's see, one more. So was there nearby agriculture that used pollinators? And if so, was there a shift in pollinator species composition when the agricultural crops bloomed out? And the short answer is no, there was no agriculture anywhere near uh, this study site. Right. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. Okay, everybody, we are going to turn this over uh, to our next speaker. Uh, Tom is online here, and I think he's, Mary is going to be um, stopping share and turning it over to Tom. All right, do I have it now? I think I may. I see your face, but not your slides, Tom. All right, All right here we go. Okay. Wow. Well, everybody, uh, thank you. Um, and that was a very interesting talk from Mary and Sandy. I really appreciated hearing some of that material again for the second time, and I, uh, it's really excellent work. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit with us and talk about partnering with pollinators, uh, prairie restoration to support diverse pollinating insects. And I'm going to take a pretty high level view on this. I'll present some of our own research, but also review some of the literature as well. Um, let's see. So um, I'm going to start here with a, just my general thoughts about uh, habitat components for pollinators. And when we're, when we're restoring or managing habitat for pollinators, uh, my assertion is that we need to be uh, doing that for the whole life cycle of the organisms we're trying to um, sustain in these habitats. So uh, on a site basis, we have the diversity of, of plants that can help uh, pollinating in insects, as well as the nesting substrates or nesting uh, conditions for those insects. We also have the landscape context, which, which matters for these species because some insects may uh, nest in one area and forage in another. And if you're going to have them present for foraging, uh, the nesting conditions or that the may, might be a different habitat that they need to live in needs to be adjacent. But all these taken together are, are part, of, part of habitat restoration for pollinators. We need to consider the diversity of insects, uh, sorry, the diversity of plants, the nesting substrates, as well as the landscape context when we're conducting restoration to support pollinators in pretty much any situation, but I'm gonna uh, really focus more on, on prairies in general. So here are some of my take home messages, really. I'll start with these and we'll touch on these as we go. Uh, first is that uh, to manage or restore for pollinators, we need to manage for insect life cycles. First, we need to include plant diversity to support insect diversity. We need to provide nesting substrates. We need to have connectivity to adjacent habitats. And uh, I'll also talk about how we manage those, those habitats with fire or herbicide, mowing, grazing, etc. So first off, I, I think we need to have some pretty pictures of pollinators just to keep this interesting. Um, so many of us are familiar with a lot of these uh, insects, but you know, bumblebees, this is Bombus californicus, I think. Um, we've got uh, bumblebees like Bombus nevadensis. This is a very large bumblebee. Um, this individual buzzed me in the spring one, one year and, and uh, I thought it was a small helicopter coming through. It's visiting an iris. Um, solitary bees, and this is a very large group of bees and, and uh, Mary and, and Sandy talked about many of these in, in their talk. This happens to be a megachylid visiting an erigeron species. But there are other kinds of, of solitary bees and other kinds of semi-social bees. There's, there's carpenter bees uh, that, that actually drill their own holes in wood and then nest in those. Um, 
there's flower flies, uh, surfeity. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's maybe in dispute how effective they are as pollinators, but they're certainly frequent floral visitors and an important component of the overall insect uh, community. Um, there's some sometimes oddballs, like this is a, a bumble flower beetle uh, in the Euphoria genus. Uh, this photo was taken in New Mexico on an astragalus. There are Lepidoptera, uh, butterflies in particular. This is an Edytha species visiting uh, a paintbrush. Uh, and uh, there are lots of different wasps that, that can be important pollinators and certainly frequent floral visitors. This happens to be a grass carrying wasp. And on the left, you can see a, a bee nesting uh, block that's been adopted by uh, the grass carrying wasps as their nesting uh, ha habitat. Um, bee flies or the bombyliids. Uh, what's interesting about these guys is they're parasitoids. Uh, so to have a diversity that includes bee flies, you have to have a diversity of insects that uh, can serve as their hosts as, as well. Um, and then there are other things that are interacting with pollinators like crab spiders and generally not pollinators, um, but they're certainly uh, important in the overall insect system. So I want to talk a little bit about why plant diversity matters. Um, plant diversity can, at least in some situations, in particular grasslands, increase insect diversity. Although I, I uh, know that, that Mary and, and Sandy found that they didn't have a direct correlation between uh, plants or flower and insect diversity. It is uh, often found in other systems. Um, plant diversity can result in continuous floral resources. So there's overlap in phenology among the, the plants so that the a diversity of insects can be supported. Uh, a diversity of host plants uh, for insects or, 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 or for parasitoids, uh, for larval feeding. Uh, so many of these insects will need plants of different types to complete their life cycle not just as adult food, but as uh, juvenile or, or larval food. Uh, and then finally, uh, some insects are, are host specialists or are, uh, uh, or plant um, um, uh, tolerant or, or work with a, a narrow group of, of plants as uh, their floral resources. So uh, some groups of plants support different kinds of insects. So plants in the astery, a very large group of plants, may have poor quality pollen, but some insects are tolerant of that poor quality. Uh, the plants in the Onagraceae, the evening primrose family, um, have stringy pollen, and some insects can handle that stringy pollen, and, and some can't. And so some, some uh, insects are specialists on that group. In the, Malvaceae, the, the uh, mallow family, uh, there, are, there can be specialists like diadasia bees on, on checker mallows, the sedalsias, and corbiculate insects in general on the genus Sphalsia. Uh, the genus Nemophila in the waterleaf family uh, has Andrina specialists primarily. So if you're going to support different groups of insects, you don't just need overlapping uh, phenology, but you may need particular groups of uh, flowering plants that support a diversity of uh, insect types. Um, I just wanted to touch on this particular experiment. This is the Jena experiment in Germany that uh, was a, is an experiment to look at the effects of plant diversity in, in, in grasslands or, or prairies on uh, lots of different ecosystem functions. One of those they, they looked at was pollinators, but this is from a review paper from that large experiment that looked at the effect of plant species richness on the, the x-axis. And then on the y-axis was the uh, organism abundance or diversity. And I wanna point out the panel in the top right, which shows the effect of plant species richness on the um, uh, richness of different uh, organisms. And this line here is pollinators. So as, uh, plant species richness increased, pollinator diversity also increased. And I know that's in, in contrast to what we just was heard, just heard uh, in the Starkey sites, but at least in some sites, as uh, the diversity of, of plant species goes up, the diversity of pollinators does as well. Um, 
And here's a, just a chart that looks at the diversity of plants and how they can provide continuous floral resources for pollinators throughout a growing season. Uh, we don't need to go through this in detail, but the, the bottom line is that uh, as uh, diversity increases, it allows um, the phenology of different plant species to support insects at different times of the season. And these may not always be the same insects throughout the whole season, but uh, it's a diversity of insects that can uh, sequentially occupy a system, uh, or it can be some groups of pollinators that are present for long term. Um, uh, finally, it's important to uh, recognize that uh, there are certain insects that require certain plant species to be present to uh, complete their life cycle uh, as their host plants. And in some insects, those uh, <clears throat> host plant relationships are very specific. They might be to a family or to a genus or an individual species of plant. So that if you want to have that insect supported in your system, you, you have to provide that plant um, so that the insects can complete their life cycle. Um, and again, there are specialists. And I just wanted to point out, this is uh, the uh, uh, a genus Clarkia uh, with a, a small solitary bee that uh, doesn't have a lot of hairs on it uh, and so it can handle the stringy pollen on this uh, kind of plant. So having different kinds of plants as well as just diversity um, can really support a diversity of insect pollinators. Um, nesting resources, I'm going to talk just briefly about nesting. Um, different uh, Insects, different bee groups, for example, um, nest in different ways. They are maybe ground nesters or uh, plant or in, uh, uh, bees that uh, nest in the hollow or pithy stems of, of dead plant material. There are cavity nesters, um, there are old nest uh, users. Uh, they might be going into some other insects pre existing burrow or an animal's uh, uh, rodent's burrow. Um, and even those that, that uh, use shells. So having a variety of nesting environments available at a site is uh, important for supporting a diversity of insect pollinators. That means making sure there's bare ground in some areas, um, dead plant material in others, uh, supporting animals that are cavity creators, etc. So uh, th these are all important and uh, Kind of point to the need for kind of messy haircuts or, or uh, restoration that's not neat and tidy and wall to wall of one kind of treatment, but has a diversity of, of nesting types available uh, and in general uh, supporting habitat uh, heterogeneity. So uh, briefly about connectivity and adjacent habitats. Um, some insects complete their life cycles in one habitat as we view it, and then uh, move for foraging for uh, adult resources into another. So prairie environments may support insects that are uh, nesting in another nearby environment. So again, habitat heterogeneity, both at the local and at the larger scale, can be critical for having high pollinator diversity at any given site. Um, here's a, a small example from this is actually from a, a forest pollinator study, but what uh, Kusser and Goodall found was that um, as the uh, distance from a, a, a remnant forest to a small patch of remnant forest increased, the pollinator diversity decreased. Uh, and that was most strong when the remnants um, had low floral diversity, especially the, the target remnant had low floral diversity. But when there was high diversity among the, the remnants, um, that relationship was still there, but it was much weaker, uh, suggesting that high, having high floral diversity, uh, even at a small patch scale, can support uh, larger numbers of insects than um, low diversity sites. But landscape context really does matter. So I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about some of the restoration tools uh, that we use in prairie restoration and some of our results from prairie restoration experiments that are intended to 
uh, boost uh, wildflower diversity. So uh, we use tools uh, like fire, controlled burning, mowing and haying, uh, livestock grazing. That upper right panel shows a, a pen with sheep in it, and that's the uh, take 20 sheep and call me in the morning prescription. Uh, flash grazing uh, is so-called, where you put in a, a large number of animals in a small space and graze intensely. Um, then we also use herbicide treatments, um, solarization and tilling. These are ways to kind of uh, reset a, a plant community and, and start over. Uh, and in some cases, we use nutrient uh, manipulation, such as adding carbon to reduce nitrogen or adding fertilizer to in increase nitrogen and other nutrients. So I'm going to talk about a few of those in an experiment we did um, that included, on top of treatments to uh, manipulate the environment, seeding treatments. So we seeded at different uh, diversity rates, uh, from a low diversity to a high diversity. So we'll talk about how those treatments interacted with seeding to result in different diversities of plants. Um, this was an experiment conducted at a place called Coyote Creek. Uh, west of Eugene, Oregon, in a large uh, uh, wet prairie system. Uh, and this is looking aerially at the experimental plots. These plots were 15 by 15 meters uh, and spaced in a grid across a wide area. Uh, and uh, these were, uh, this was in a habitat where the environment had been partly restored and we were then uh, using different experimental treatments and seeding diversities to see how we could add uh, plant diversity to the community. So in general, adding seeds did increase diversity, but it depended very much on the treatment. And what we show here is that as seed addition increased, the diversity of seed uh, addition increased, species richness could increase as well. But much of that was restricted to the burn treatment. So we did treatments that included mowing, haying, grazing, and burning. Um, but burning was the only treatment that reliably resulted in higher diversity of plants when we seeded. And that's because burning created a superior seed bed for uh, plants to germinate and grow. And so uh, one of the conclusions of that is to increase uh, suitability of this habitat for pollinators, uh, burning is a tool that can uh, be quite effective. Burning had some other effects on the community to um, reduce dominance of grasses and create open soils, uh, and those can be uh, helpful for pollinators as well. Burning um, can uh, potentially affect pollinators though because you know, burning is hot and it removes litter layers and exposes uh, nesting dens. Uh, this is uh, some ground nesting bee uh, entrances after a fire, and so they've been exposed, they're quite obvious. So one of the concerns might be that ground nesting bees are uh, vulnerable to uh, burning, and, and perhaps uh, controlled burns or wildfire could be, have negative effects on these kinds of bees. Uh, fortunately, there has been quite a bit of research on this topic, and uh, for example, um, Kane and Neff found that um, a lot of the ground nesting bees um, uh, nested fairly deep, you know, 10 centimeters or deeper, and nest cells uh, uh, less than five centimeters deep, deep were at the highest risk from fire. Uh, but those from five to 10 uh, and those uh, at less than 10 were at, at lower or no risk of burning impacts on, on the bees. And uh, the majority of, of ground nesting bees uh, go deeper than, than five centimeters. Um, in another study, uh, Panzer found that um, remnant, uh, that, that um, insects in a remnant that were dependent on that remnant uh, in that they, they weren't nesting off site and then coming over to use the, the remnant, those that were remnant dependent, um, Many of them were fire positive species. They, they responded very quickly and positively to a uh, controlled fire. Some were neutral. Um, and a few uh, were um, negatively affected for a year or a few years, but then responded. Um, so that 
the, his results, a quote from his paper is that his results support the judicious use of rotational cool season burning within small isolated grassland sites in his, in his system. So there was, uh, there's some concern that there could be negative effects on a few species of burning, but for the vast majority of, of these species, uh, burning had a positive effect. So burning is really an important tool for, for grassland management in, in many systems. Um, one way to kind of mitigate the risks of disturbances like fire is to rotate them across a site. Um, this is a species pair uh, with Fender's blue butterfly on Kincaid's lupin. Uh, the lupin species responds very positively to fire. It's like pouring rocket fuel on this plant. But the, bee, the, bu the butterfly is vulnerable um, because its um, larvae uh, at, in the, the burn season period, which is late summer in this system, the larvae uh, nest or, or um, persist at uh, around ground level in the litter layer, making them quite vulnerable to, to burning. Depending on burn severity, they may be all of them killed or 75% or, or so of them killed. Uh, so, we look at this system and recommend that burning be conducted in a rotational manner so that none of the habitat is burned or some of the habitat is burned in a given year but not all of it and we do things like a, a one-third at a time burn and rotate so that every year that one-third of the habitat is burned and the, the butterfly and the lupin seem to respond very favorably to that kind of management scheme so this is um a bit of death by PowerPoint, but I wanted to walk through just a little of this uh, uh, at a high level to uh, talk about what the literature says about these different types of management. So burning for most species, uh, strongly beneficial, but may depend on partial burns or recolonization from offsite. Mowing and haying are generally positive for a solitary bee diversity in prairies. Uh, but again, it, it may depend on the timing and the frequency. You know, obviously uh, mowing in the mid-season when plants are blooming and, and bees are actively foraging could have a negative effect. But waiting until uh, after the, the uh, active season for insects and plants is, is better. Uh, grazing, it can have mixed um, effects. And I won't talk about that too much because Mary and Sandy uh, did such a good job uh, on their system. But in general, as in intensity increases, bee diversity declines. Uh, land clearing using herbicides or tillage, solarization can have short-term major disruptions, but in the long-term have positive effects when those are used as part of a restoration scheme. Uh, nutrient manipulation, in general, nit nitrogen addition, uh, whether that's from um, air pollution, uh, atmospheric deposition, or intentional addition of nitrogen for fertilization, can potentially have negative effects due to the increases in grasses and shifts to earlier phenology. And grasses tend to compete strongly with uh, wildflowers and forbs. So that's why that can have a, a negative effect as well. And then finally, planting. In the short term, it depends on the method. Going out there with a drill or plugging with an auger or something can, can have negative effects. But in the long term, with the increases in plant diversity, um, that can increase pollinator diversity and health as well. So uh, to recap, uh, restoring prairie for pollinators, uh, my points are that diversity of plant species matters. I, I often say diversity is magic. It, it diversity begets diversity. Uh, it increases ecosystem function in many ways, and pollinators are one part of that. The availability of substrates for nesting is important. Uh, bare soil, hollow stems, uh, parasitoid hosts, um, all kinds of different nesting environments are needed if you're going to have all kinds of different insects and pollinators. Connectivity to adjacent habitats is, is crucial for some species. Uh, having prairies that are adjacent to woodlands or riparian areas uh, can uh, put the habitats in which their host plants or their nesting habitat uh, is available. And then finally, managing with fire and herbicide can be important. Uh, but uh, considering rotating burns across sites is one way to mitigate for any short-term negative effects and allow recolonization across the site after those disturbances. So um, that's all I have for you today, and I'm, I'm happy to 
uh, entertain questions uh, if we've got any. And I'm looking, can, um, Catherine, can you help me with questions if there are any? Sure. Um, I have from Janelle uh, St. Pierre. She says, are you aware of other good studies for connectivity for pollinators? Um, you know, there, there is quite a lot of research and, and literature on that. Uh, so I would go to Google Scholar and uh, type in pollinator habitat connectivity. And I think you'll find quite a lot. And then we have another question from Nicole Rinali. Um, what is your recommended fire return interval? Well, you know, it depends on the system. Um, for some species I've worked on that are, that are plants, annual fires are optimal. Um, but in the prairie systems we work in, mostly here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, a three-year burn rotation seems to be a sweet spot. It's good enough for many plants and not too frequent to uh, eliminate uh, an insect flora from the system. So, uh, you know, three years is, is kind of a sweet spot. Often fires or uh, control burns can be difficult to arrange and implement. Uh, some people reach for more like a five-year return interval um, or even longer, but uh, then you, you really start having uh, um, problems with um, increased dominance from some of the vegetation and loss of some uh, other components. Any more questions from people? Sarah, uh, thank you for posting that link to the Kane and Neff paper. That's awesome. We really appreciate that. Yeah, great. Any, thank you. Yeah, any more questions for Tom? Oh, Sarah Hudson's got one. Can you see that one, Tom, or do you want me to read I it? I can't. Uh, go okay. ahead. Sarah Hudson says, in regard to the diversity is magic concept, is there a size limit to which this fails? For example, if one has a small plot of land at home to devote to pollinators, is it beneficial to have a large amount of diversity, but only a few of each plant, or better to stick to a few species, but more numerous? That is a great question. And um, I, I don't really know the answer. I think it will depend on the resident insect fauna that is uh, around you. How diverse is that? And, and you might have to start thinking about what you want to target. What's, what's really interesting for me, though, as a, a backyard gardener slash restorationist is that um, when I have different plants in bloom in my yard, I, it, I never can predict what I'm going to see, except for you know honeybees and bumblebees, which are more ubiquitous. But the solitary bees are, are much more difficult to predict. I think having, um, uh, uh, I, I, if I was going to shoot from the hip here, uh, I would say dense patches of single species and uh, as many of those as you can accommodate uh, would be helpful. Um, you know, not having just one or two individuals of any plant. Uh, I think you need to have some kind of mass to, to be attractive to pollinators, to bring them in from some distance at all. Um, but, you know, you're, you're going to be limited by your space. So uh, good luck with that. I, that. That's a great question. Yeah, that is, I, 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 this whole biodiversity thing is uh, becoming more and more of a, of a topic. I just posted a couple of things on our Facebook page about it. Um, Wendy Bellman uh, asked, what might be a suggestion for maximum acres to burn at one time? What is the home range of many solitary bees? A few acres or 10 to hundreds of acres? So that's kind of two related questions. There. Yeah, but that, that's a great question. And you know, I think that's a landscape scale question. It depends on the landscape you're in. If you're in a, a large landscape with, you know, many thousands of prairie acres, then larger burns uh, make a lot of sense. But if your landscape is very fragmented and you've got, you know, 10 to 100 acres here and there, um, burning a large proportion of that in any one year could have negative effects on one group of insects and make it difficult for them to recolonize. So I think that's, that's a very scale dependent question, but, but a good one, I, I appreciate that. Um, another question, Vicki Owen asks, how long would it take for something to be an established plot? After uh, planting natives. Uh, say that again? How long would it take after planting natives to consider an area an established plot? Oh, uh, that, that's great. You know, when we do restoration, uh, generally the first year after restoring, is um, it practically anomalous because uh, plants tend to uh, grow and settle down and, and uh, seek some kind of equilibrium. Um, generally, if for us, 
two, three, four years after a, a significant restoration, which is sort of a do-over restoration where we're establishing all the new vegetation, is when we are getting to the vegetation type that we think is going to persist. But that's also the point at which we need to return to disturbance uh, management tools like uh, returning fire and, and spot treating weeds and that kind of thing. So um, it's usually, um, a, you know, two to three years, four years is when you would consider your vegetation established. But that, that may a bit differ in different kind of prairie systems. Great, thank you. Um, Nathan's got a question. This is a good one. Um, Nathan Schulte says, do you have recommendations for urban natural areas where burning is not an option? Sure, yeah. Uh, burning is absolutely not appro uh, appropriate in some places and not allowed. Um, so I, I think it disturbances, I don't think there's anything magic about fire per se for pollinators, um, but it does clear land uh, and make open soil. So if you can do other things to create open soil, whether that's just scraping or you know, mowing, um, th those sorts of treatments uh, might be haying, uh, depending on the, the context. So you don't have a bunch of dead material just you know, that you chopped, but it's now covering the ground. But creating open soil patches is important. Um, if you've got uh, plants that have hollow or pithy stems, um, cutting those so those those cut ends are exposed and leaving them around in in, in piles or distributed in the habitat, um, I think those are those are good techniques to to help create um, nesting habitat. You can also go to the extreme of of creating like bee hotels, you know, nesting um, houses where you've got a, a, a set of different diameter holes in either blocks or, or um, tied up bundles of stems that you're protecting from, from direct rainfall and um, putting out where bees can use them. And you can actually have a, a measurable effect on your local bee abundance by providing that nesting habitat. Awesome, there's a couple more and then I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Sarah Semler, thank you for, you're so helpful for posting foraging ranges for solitary bees, awesome. Excellent, um, thank you. Yeah, Ray Morans uh, asks, can you compare and contrast the effects of winter slash early spring burning versus summer burning? Um, again, I think that's very um, system specific. Most of my experience is in the Pacific Northwest where we have a Mediterranean type climate so that in early spring, um, we may be able to get a burn off, but it's generally wet. <laughs> uh, and if it's if spring has really started, if it, you know, late winter is when we often do get a burn window and insects aren't very active and, and uh, plants aren't flowering yet. And so sometimes we do uh, late winter burns, like a February burn. Um, but otherwise we're restricted to late summer or even fall burns um, because uh, that's after the growing season, uh, everything's turned brown and, and uh, insects have largely uh, gone into uh, some kind of dormancy or, or, or gone. Um, but I know in other systems like in the Midwest, burns can be done at different times. Uh, and uh, I just don't have much experience with that, so I can't comment. Okay, how about one more question? This one's from Rick. He asks, how much would we consider grasshoppers in the pollinator world? And I, I'm, I'm assuming that question means, do grasshoppers pollinate or how do they impact pollinators? Not sure yeah. exactly. I, I love that question. I, I think in general, grasshoppers are, are not considered pollinators. They need, they're certainly plant visitors because they eat plants. Uh, and they may even be floral visitors in, in some cases, but they're generally just eating whatever their whatever plant material they're landing on, or maybe your data sheets if you're out doing uh, field work. Well, grasshoppers are voracious, but you know I consider grasshoppers and I consider really managing for pollinators as managing for the insect community. So, and I think grasshoppers are part of that. They serve an ecosystem function when they have uh, when they when they're massing and they're having uh, large effects on plant communities by uh, grazing, there could be long-term positive effects of that short-term negative effect. Uh, so they may be eating plants that are in flower and really disrupting other pollinator networks. Um, but in the long run, they're causing a disturbance that's potentially reducing uh, dominance in a system from any one plant uh, and helping with plant diversity. So, you know, I say they're part of the club and we can manage for them too. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump in here. Um, that's pretty much winds it up for questions. I had a few extra that I'm going to pass on to Mary and Sandy. Um, I wanted to thank Mary and the U.S. Forest Service, Sandy, the Oregon State University, and uh, Tom, thank you so much for you and the Institute for Applied Ecology. The video archive is going to be posted very soon. Uh, you can check for that on our website or on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't registered for the next webinar, please do it because, believe it or not, even though we raised our ceiling, we're still running out of seats because there's so many people who want to see these. Um, we have a limited number of seats available for that. Um, you can find everything under the webinar tab on our website. And that's really it. I wanted to thank everybody for the fabulous questions. The discussion that these um, webinars are, are touching off are really amazing. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone, and we will see you again soon.